to be a part of our service. And of course, tonight we take the opportunity to celebrate with uh, Caitlin, who has graduated high school. And so praise the Lord for that. And so it's a chance for us just to uh, encourage her as now she moves on into real life. Amen? <laughs> And so let's take our hymn books, turn to number 70, if you will. Holy, holy, holy. Let us stand. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Oh, 
singing forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. And so that time is coming, isn't it? And so we will be with him for eternity. Well, let's turn to number 186. 186. As we sing the churches, one foundation. And that one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Ready? 186. And we'll sing the first and the last verses, 186.
This is not a typical passage. Congratulation. I thought tonight we would focus our attention. Caitlin might feel like I'm preaching directly to her. And maybe I am a little bit. <laughs> so you don't have to hide. <laughs> but uh, I just want to encourage Caitlin tonight. And it's exciting to be able to celebrate her graduation because it's a significant milestone. It's a point in time that an uh, individual sort of reaches where they make a major transition in a number of ways. Uh, moving on from uh, school, you know, secondary, or, uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, and still uh, basically living under uh, your parents' uh, leadership and direction, and you're making that move to now uh, basically starting life for yourself and perhaps moving on to college and then of course whatever lies ahead beyond that so there's kind of these transition points in our life that come up and this is one of them and so i kind of wanted to focus our attention on that tonight uh, now of course they have graduations for almost uh, uh, almost every grade now so you can graduate from kindergarten you can graduate from elementary school and, and so on but uh, I know when we went to school it was kind of it's been all those years looking forward to graduation day because that was it schooling was done little did we know that the learning was only just the beginning and uh, but it is a significant point in the life of uh, each and every one of us and so it is fitting that we might take a few moments and uh, focus our attention on that tonight. When we look at this particular passage here, you could almost say that this was graduation day for the disciples. The disciples had been under the teaching and leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ for three and a half years. And I've said it many times before, I'll say it again, how exciting in some ways it would be to be there and to be taught directly by him. I think anybody that's in full-time ministry as a pastor is one of those things you almost kind of wish. I just wish I would have had a few minutes with Jesus to ask him questions about this passage and ask him about that passage or ask him about this event or that event and just, just to get more clarification. But of course, that was 2,000 years ago, so we're not able to do that. However, we do have the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus ministered and worked and taught each one of these individuals that would call him their, that he would call his disciples, and of course, the, the 12 that we know that would become the apostles, Jesus spent the most time with. And taught them directly. And so when we get to this point in the book of Matthew, Jesus is basically getting ready to ascend the kingdom of heaven. He has finished his work. He has come to the end of his life here on earth and will ascend up to his father and will take on a uh, role of uh, mediator on our behalf, sitting at the right hand of the father. And so he's about to uh, basically push the disciples on to go and do what he trained them up to do. So this is sort of graduation day for the disciples. They will now have to go into the world. They will now have to continue the work that he trained them up to do. They will now have to, they won't have Jesus right there with them, holding their hand, helping them through some of the challenges that they will face. They will have to figure out some of these things for themselves. They will have to rely on the information that Jesus had given them. They will have to think back to the, the many uh, opportunities that Jesus used to, uh, to, you know, through some of the miracles that he did, through just some of the events that he was able to teach. They would have to think back to those things to remember, okay, we have this, this situation, how did Jesus deal with that? 
I mean, how nice it was for them when uh, even during his teaching time, he did send them out to go and uh, practice what they'd been taught. But they had the opportunity to at least come back to the Lord Jesus. And although, although the scriptures don't really give that to us, they had the opportunity to kind of come back and say to Jesus, okay, I did this, did I do it right? Now, how many times have we done that our, ourselves? Especially when we're first learning things. You know, it's great to be able to go back to our parents, try and, you know, as you get older, that's, that's one thing about the process of growing up is allowing your children to kind of experience some things, and as they get older, and as they mature, they get to experience a little bit more. They get to have a little more freedom. And what's nice is they have that opportunity to experience that freedom, to make some choices, and then to come back to mom and dad and say, hey, you know, this is what's happened, this is how I responded, was that good or bad? You know, that's, a, that's part of the process of growing up and maturing. And I'm sure it was no different for the disciples. They had that opportunity in that three and a half years to keep coming back to Jesus and saying, you know, how do we handle this? How do we understand this better? Remember, they said to Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. They had heard Jesus pray. They had seen the work and the things that he spoke. And they would have prayed in the past because they were certainly not ignorant of the Jewish uh, culture from which they grew up in. They understood, you know, the scriptures as, as much as they could, the Old Testament, and so they certainly understood that they were to pray, but they come to Jesus. Jesus, teach us how to pray. In other words, how to pray more effectively. Once Jesus would be gone off the scene, of course, they couldn't do that. They would have to depend upon the experiences that they had with him, and they'd have to depend upon the things that they had, had learned. We got down to verse 16, and it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. That's incredible, isn't it? Even after three and a half years of witnessing what Jesus did and all that he taught, and even the fact that he did tell them, did warn them that the time would come, he would be raised up, he would be nailed to the cross, but that he would rise again. Remember, he told them that you know they would destroy this temple, but in three days he would raise it up again. And he clarified that by explaining he wasn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem, although that's the backdrop by which he gave uh, his instruction. But he had shown them that it wasn't uh, uh, the temple he was talking about, but it was himself. He was referring to himself. And yet, in all that they experienced and all that they saw and witnessed for themselves, it says here that some even doubted that this was Jesus. And yet I think they quickly came to realize that, yeah, this is Jesus. This is the Messiah. This is the one that we had spent the last three and a half years with. And now it was their time to go and do that which Jesus had trained them up to do. This was graduation day. He says there in verse uh, 17, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now we recognize Jesus already had that power, right? When he, when he says here, all power is given unto me, it wasn't that God suddenly gave him special powers that he didn't have before. No, Jesus, being God in the flesh, he had all power, didn't he? He had all power, he had all majesty and glory. He was God, he was divine, he was in the flesh. Amen. But he did it. God gave him a power and responsibility to send his disciples out. Look at John chapter 20. Let's turn keep your finger there in Matthew 28. But turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20 and verse 21. And in verse 
verse 19, it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst. So they're in the upper room. But roughly close to the same time that we're reading the quote in Matthew, but they're still in the upper room. It says, uh, they were, He stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, and then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so, he says, send I you. That's the power that Jesus is referring to here. His Father gave him all power to come and to minister. His Father sent him to the earth to teach to make disciples, and then, of course, to finish the work on the cross of Calvary. And he says, as, as my Father has sent me, he says, even so, send I you. This is graduation day for the disciples. It is now, you, you recognize, and we looked at this not too long ago, in the book of, uh, in the, uh, the book of John, we see how, uh, uh, the disciples, after all is said and done here, and Jesus uh, uh, has risen from the dead, um, it tells us that after they left the upper room, they went back to fishing. But that's not what Jesus, after three and a half years of ministry and teaching and all that he did, he didn't want the disciples just to go back to the same old thing they were doing before, did he? He had a task for them. He had a purpose in the work, the, the things that he taught them. He wanted them to fulfill that purpose. Come back to Matthew chapter 28. It's graduation day for the disciples. But this did not mean that all work was done for the disciples. This did not mean that this was it. You've done this work, you've achieved that, and so now it's kind of just wait till the Lord Jesus Christ returns and the Lord calls you home. No, this was graduation day. It meant that they were to take up their cross and do that which Jesus had prepared them for. Back to Matthew chapter 28. And he gives them a command here. The first part of the command he gives them is... He says in verse 19, go. Usually we talk about this in the way of missionaries. We think of missionaries going to the mission field. And many times, uh, new missionaries will usually preach messages on this. But really, the Bible makes it clear that we're all called to be missionaries, aren't we? We're all called to do the work of spreading the gospel. And so as he says here in verse 19 to his disciples, he says, go. Don't just stay here. Don't go back to the way things used to be. Go forward. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Holy Ghost, and of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. The sense in that passage there of go ye therefore is an expectation from the Lord Jesus Christ that they will be going. That they will go out into this world. They will go and do what God had trained them up to do. That the Lord Jesus Christ specifically sat down and prepared them for. In other words, this is what Jesus was instructing them to do. They were to go. In other words, they were to take responsibility for their salvation and for their life. Jesus had been with them for three and a half years, had been teaching them, telling them about salvation, telling them about himself, telling them about his father, telling them about the work that had to be done. And now it was time for them to take responsibility for their own salvation and for their own life. Now that's a significant shift for us as we graduate from these major milestones in our life. I think of Caitlin 
graduating from high school, that was a significant shift because now she must go and she must take responsibility for her own life. Her mom and dad have done a, an amazing job, and I can say that because I could see it in Caitlin's character and her personality and the, the in, in, in who she is. They've done an amazing job, and praise the Lord for that. But our work is done. Now, Caitlin, don't worry, they're still there. They've got cash to go to the wolves and <laughs> let you fend for yourself. But there is a, a shift in that, you know, you have to take responsibility for your life and even for your salvation. And boy, that can be a scary thing. You always have, uh, you know, I think of the disciples, they always kind of had the Lord Jesus uh, there by their side. And so when they had doubts on their salvation, they could at least go to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saved. Or Jesus, I, I said that I believe in you. Does that mean I'm going to heaven? And I'm sure the disciples had those times in which they felt like we've all gone through that ourselves. But then when we did it on our own, I know when I, uh, we were first saved, even I and both first saved, I was excited. There was so much to learn, but there was also times in which you, you thought, well, boy, you know, I, I know I, I asked Jesus to save me, I prayed, I, I, I see myself as a sinner, but, uh, you know, am I really saved? And that's just normal. I've, I've heard many testimonies from, uh, especially at camp, you'll hear this, where individuals will come forward uh, in senior high or junior high, and they will say, you know what? I accepted the Lord back when I was five or six or seven years old. But now I'm not sure. And they will come forward and they'll make a decision and, and it's not for salvation a second time. Many times it's just for assurance of salvation. They knew they'd done the right things. They knew that they believed. But now it's a point in time of, you know, they've, they've had some doubts. They've gone through some struggle perhaps, and they, and they finally kind of get it right. And I've seen that happen many times at camp. And that's all right. But now we must take up responsibility for our own salvation. We have to live it out in our lives. Caitlin, as you graduate from high school and you prepare to move on and do that which God has prepared for you, you have a responsibility to have your salvation for yourself. You can't depend on anybody else for your salvation. Never can we depend upon anybody else for our salvation. Amen? Amen. It's between you and God. Nobody else can get you saved, and nobody else can get saved for you. It's you that has to come before God and ask Jesus Christ to save you. But there does come a time when we need to stand on our own and stand on our own two feet. But the good news is, is you have the Lord Jesus Christ to help you. You have the, the Word of God to guide you. You have the encouragement of your church family to be there to lift you up and to help you along. And to give you that, you know, to continue to give you that encouragement. The disciples were told to go. They were to take responsibility for the things that they learned for their salvation. And they were to live their life. Not only were they told to go, but you notice the, the next part of the command there in verse 19 is Jesus said, Go ye therefore and do what? Teach. And that word teach there is basically make disciples. Each and every one of us, we need to be disciple makers. Did you realize that? Now that doesn't mean that every one of us has to uh, carve out a shingle and put it on our door and say, official disciple maker. You know, open from 8 to 5. Come and I'll help you become a disciple. No, that's not what it's saying, right? But we are commissioned to become disciple makers. In other words, it just means we have a responsibility to go and share the gospel. What he's telling his disciples here is two key things. Go and make disciples. The first one is this, is go and be an example. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> and verse 1 
says, Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye do what? Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all holiness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What Paul is saying here in Ephesians is that we're to go and be an example. Walk worthy of the vocation. What's the vocation? We're called to be little Christians, aren't we? We're called to be little Christ. We're called to be uh, an ambassador of him. And so we're to, in essence, walk, talk, work, and behave like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he says, go and make disciples, he says, go and be an example. Walk the talk. You say you love me, keep my commandments. You say you believe in me, then behave as I would behave. Paul says, follow me as I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're to go and make disciples. They were to be an example. They would carry on behaving like the Lord Jesus Christ so that when individuals looked at them, they didn't see Peter, they didn't see John, they didn't see the other disciples. When people looked to them, they saw the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who they ought to go to. Or some character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go and make disciples. And the second part of making disciples is this, is go and be a witness. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Be an example and be a witness. In other words, buy up those opportunities to share the gospel message, to share the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, to tell the unsaved that there is hope in Jesus Christ, in salvation. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always. How often is that? Yeah, all the time, right? It's kind of, there, there's no, uh, no excuse here. We can't say, well, it's Monday, and I haven't even had a chance to, to think yet, Right? Or it's Thursday, and Thursday's just a busy day, and I don't have time to be talking about the Lord. No, he says, be ready always. Sanctify the Lord in your heart, and be ready always, he says, to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the what? The hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In other words, be ready to share that hope. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be ready to share the hope of salvation that you've obtained by Jesus going to the cross of Calvary and by putting your faith and trust in Him. That's what He's saying. Be ready to share a testimony and to tell someone when they ask you, Why are you different? Why do you not act and behave like everyone else? Well, let me tell you, Jesus Christ changed my life. He says, go and make disciples. Go ye therefore and teach. Caitlin, as you graduate, you now have to take responsibility for your own life, your own walk in salvation. And as you do that, as you go, you have no idea where the Lord's going to lead you, what comes next. It's kind of, it, it's scary and it's exciting at the same time. And because, you know, with not knowing what's going to happen can be scary, but sometimes it can be exciting. It's like, okay, where's God going to take me next? For you, it says, not to the north, <laughs> not to the north. <laughs> Been there, done that. But as you as you go, you're going to go, and you're going to live your life, and you're going to follow God's leading. Find a nice young man that we approve of. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but go, 